you gave me my life. I mean, I didn't have to start over. I'm still successful. I'm still going stronger than ever. You're like my role model. I mean, you gave me that confidence to move on. You guided me as a mother figure, as a friend, as a lawyer. I don't think I could have done it without you. That timing, you became that focal point for me. You guided me. I listened to you. I know times were bad at times. I wanted to give up. At the end of the day, she is going to help you. All right. Welcome to this edition of this podcast. And uh, I am talking with Paul Landy, who is one of my former clients and actually one of the craziest cases. I've been practicing law for 21 years, and this was one of the craziest cases I'd ever seen. So uh, I'm really excited to share this with everyone. Welcome, Paul. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So let's just take a little walk through memory lane here, shall we? I met you in November of 2015. So I can't believe it's been five years ago already. That's just crazy. Amazing. But um, you had come into my office because your wife had filed a domestic violence action against you, but you weren't uh, served with it. You just got served with a hearing. That's what it was. Yeah. So we knew that there was a hearing coming up like in a couple of weeks. And so you really just wanted representation at the hearing at that point. Right. Correct. Yeah. You, you did not want a divorce at that point. No. So you come in with your cousin and um, you said that there had been an incident. You had, uh, slashed your wife's tires, right? Uh-huh. Okay, so tell me about that. What happened What happened was, I guess she never came home that night. And well, isn't she staying at your mom's or something at that point? Well, it all started was that she moved out with the children to Phyllis and John's house. That And that's your mom and, and dad? Yes, correct. And she um, basically moved into Phyllis and John's house, which is my parents, and... Um, she was doing her own thing. But at that point, you guys were kind of still trying to maybe- We were trying to mend mend the marriage. Right, so she goes and stays with your parents, with the kids. Yes. Yes. And then you find out what? Um, That she is at a guy's house, I believe, somewhere in, I think, Bonita Springs, Florida, I'm assuming. Right. And so you go to that place at what, three o'clock in the morning or something? I think there was a, a GPS on her vehicle. That's oh. how I knew. That's how I knew she was there. Got it. Okay. And you get there and you see her car. Right. And, and I happened? did. And I did the stupidest thing. By the biggest mistake of my life is I popped one of her tires. Okay. And it was on video. On video. Yeah. So she files this restraining order against you, and uh, this hearing is set. And you said, okay, I, represent me at the hearing, but I don't want a divorce. Correct. Okay. So the, the next time that we're talking, um, that night before the hearing on her restraining order against you. So now the court is supposed to decide whether or not to enter this restraining order against you. November 26, 2015. She shows up the night before. Between 12 and 2 in the morning. Right. Let's herself in with the key. Because mm-hmm. it's the marital home. You're there marital. by yourself at night. And yeah. you own a couple of restaurants. So it's normal for you to get home late. Yes. And she knew that you would always get home late. Yep. Always parked my car uh, outside. Never parked in the garage. Okay, so car is there. She knows you're there. Mm-hmm. She's by herself, lets herself into the house. And what happens? Thank God the video camera was rolling. You, you turn your phone on yeah. and you yeah. say, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? Prior to coming into the home, she uh, strolled to the kitchen. And that's when she went into the drawer and picked, uh, grabbed a steak knife. That's before she confronted me. So she went into the home 
and uh, went into the kitchen. I don't know if you, do you remember the video? Oh, I do. Uh, I, that, that's on video with her picking up the knife. You yes. had already turned on the video at that point. Yeah. Uh, so she p- uh, picks, up the, uh, picks up the knife and she uh, goes into the bedroom where I was and um, she started to ransack the home. Uh, drawing my stuff uh, out of the closet, taking things off my desk uh, in my office with the with the mail and stuff like that, uh, saying that she stating that she is here for picking up Mason's ear medicine. And I, I don't know if you remember. Keep in mind that uh, this is two in the morning. She's saying Mason uh, needed his eardrops, which uh, John is a doctor, which. Pres- can prescribe Mason's ear medication. So uh, your, your father is a surgeon. Yes. She's staying at his home. Correct. Basically rans- started ransacking the house. And uh, the next thing you know, um, I'm being attacked. So what does she do? She starts like grabbing at you. Grabbing at me, swinging at me, uh, which the knife is still in her possession. I grab hold of the knife and... Um, now, meanwhile, I want to make sure that I say on the video, you say I'm being attacked. Yes. And she actually says, yep, you're being attacked. Being attacked. And uh, she knew she was on video. Uh, I stated a few times that I was being attacked. And um, I, pr- I proceeded to uh, get away from her. I finally escorted myself uh, outside the marital home. And that's when I proceeded to call 911. Right. Police come. Police come. Um, Meanwhile, now she followed me outside the home. So as the police were coming, I was outside the home. As soon as she went outside the home, I got myself back into the home and locked the doors. Uh, Moments later, the police arrived. um, And I'm watching this from inside. And um, the officers came into the home saw all the markings. I don't know if you recall the markings on my neck, the markings on my face. And, and uh, on your chest and belly too, like I, you sent us pictures. Yep, uh, I had markings on my chest, on my shoulders. And uh, the police uh, asked to see the video. I proceeded to show them the video and uh, my soon to be ex-wife was detained and arrested. She was, she was arrested. Yes. Yeah. So, and so she gets arrested. She's like t- led away in handcuffs, spends the night in jail, mm-hmm. right? Next morning, it's time for the hearing on her domestic violence injunction against you. And she's brought out of custody in the green jumpsuit. The green jumpsuit, yes. Having been arrested the night before. Correct. Correct. And so the judge was like, okay, we're dropping this. Yes, I think it was, um, it was tossed. It was thrown out of court. Correct. It was dismissed. And at that point you said to me, okay, I'm ready to file for a divorce now. <laughs> that, that, I guess that was the icing on the cake. Yeah. <laughs> so we filed for divorce that day. We filed for divorce that day. And we ask for a custody evaluation, supervised time sharing, and all of that based on the fact that she now has uh, actually a no contact order against, or you have one against her at that point. Right, because of her arrest. Correct. So she's now not allowed to go near you, not allowed to go near the marital home. Correct. Right. So... The next thing that happens is she calls you uh, at the restaurant. At the restaurant. And tells you to go look at her car. Go, yes. Um, She was having car trouble. I believe she took her car to European Motors on, um, I believe, Trade Center Way. I was hesitant about going there. The good hearted guy I was, I went there to basically pay for the uh, whatever problem was going on with the car, not knowing that um, she was trying to set me up. Right. So you go there 
it's it's closed at the time, I think, right? So you you no, check, they were open. Oh, they were open. But you look at the car. You you go and you look at the car. Yes. Okay, and and that's it. You were with your cousin. I was with my cousin. And your cousin Rich is uh, also a partner in your in one of your restaurants. Yes, and he's also what, uh, my son's godfather. Right, one of your best friends, but he's also your cousin. He's also your business partner in yes. one of the restaurants. Yes. So you go do that. Next thing we know, her first lawyer is fired. She hires a new lawyer. And lo and behold, you get a new injunction filed against you. Absolutely. Again. Uh-huh. And it's for what? It's for going to look at the car. Uh, going, to, going to look at the car at the, uh, at the European Motor, Motor Works. Right. Uh, and then she also threw in some extra things like that you had. The GPS. The, the GPS, but you know, there were other things that she didn't, didn't include in her first one, like that there had been pot in the house at one point. Okay, yes, so it, uh, she brought up uh, marijuana, alcohol, pills. Um, uh, that you had lot. thrown her cell phone like four years before or something like, she just threw in all these extra things. I was being uh, labeled as an alcoholic, uh, drug abuse, child beater, wife beater. Right, so, and then this time the injunctions against you, and I mean, f for the kids as well. Yes. So now you don't even get to see your kids at this point. Um, well, prior to that injunction being placed that, um, uh, I guess she was doing this without our awareness. And then that late evening coming home from work, I had a, a sheriff's office come to the door telling me I had 20 minutes to vacate the marital home. Which was kind of crazy because she wasn't allowed at the marital home either at that point. Correct. So she moves back into the marital home when there's actually an injunction against her for being at the marital home. Yes, and, and technically she's in violation of being in that marital home. Correct, correct. So, but then mysteriously, a few days later, the state attorney drops the case against her. Absolutely. And we had no idea why. No idea why. Yeah, they just said, that's it, we're dropping the case. So we suspected that her attorney at the time had some kind of connection with the state attorney's office and got it dropped. That's what we expected. Right. So now, there's nothing against her anymore. It's only against you. Correct. So we go to a hearing on December 16th. We don't finish. We go back on December 18th. We don't finish again. Now it gets reset for March 9th. And this is all on this temporary injunction where there's actually no, there's been no hearing on any of her charges whatsoever yet. Absolutely nothing. Right. She just files this thing. She gets this injunction against you. And now it's like going to be three months before you even get to have a say about this hearing. Right. Yep. So before, so in February, February 3rd, her second attorney dies. Unexpectedly. Dies unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. So the next thing that happens is I get a call. Paul's being arrested for violating this injunction that doesn't even have, we haven't even had a hearing on the merits of, of this injunction yet, but you're being violated on it. Yes. Okay, so tell us about that. She claimed that I supposedly went to the marital home uh, looking through her windows, which was not the case. I get violated for uh, supposedly uh, 
um, going into the uh, Indigo Lakes and uh, go looking in, in the windows of the marital home. And, and the violation is, is precipitated by uh, an affidavit that was filed by a private investigator named Chris Knott who files this injunction and says, you know, and files this affidavit and says, he saw you do it. Yes. Right? Correct. And, um, and so they, they arrest you. And they arrest me. And I, I went, I spent, I think that, uh, this was the first, uh, first arrest. I spent, uh, I think two nights in jail on, on that charge. Yeah, uh, violate, uh, violating. So here you are. You're being violated for an injunction that no one has, ha has even heard the merits on yet. Correct. Okay. So then March 9th, we are supposed to have this hearing and finally have it on the merits of the injunction. And she doesn't have a new lawyer yet, allegedly. Right. Correct. Correct. She had an inter internal uh, interim lawyer. Yeah, so two lawyers come forward and say that they're hired just to file the continuance. Uh, Tony Perez and Cynthia Hall. So meanwhile, her lawyer has been dead for a month, but she says she doesn't have a new lawyer yet. Correct. So we finally get to a hearing around March 16th or something. And she says, shows all kinds of pictures of her being bruised and stuff. And the injunction gets entered. The, yeah, the injunction was granted. So the next thing that happens is I took a look at her arrest picture. Do you remember this? I remember this so clearly. Okay, so tell, tell, tell us about that. You uh, got a picture of her, I believe her mugshot. She claimed that um, I, I believe bruised her face or her eye. And when you were looking at her mugshot, there was no de definitive markings on her face whatsoever. Right, so there was a difference between the pictures that she showed at the hearing and her mugshot. Correct. And of course, I didn't have a picture of her mugshot at the hearing. So there was no way that I could know that until after. So we file a motion for rehearing and reconsideration. Correct. So, and meanwhile, you're supposed to be doing supervised visitation with your kids all this time, right? Yeah, I mean, um, but you didn't want to do it because I didn't want to put my kids through any any of the nightmare that I was going through, and uh, I just felt morally it wasn't the right thing to do. And your kids were how old at this time? Like seven and thirteen, or something like that, right? Yeah, about uh, six and twelve, seven and thirteen, give or take. Yeah, yeah. So we go to a motion for rehearing in May. Uh, and by that time, we had hired Donald Day. Donald Day. Okay, as, as your criminal attorney. Yes. And we get the motion for rehearing granted. Absolutely. Okay. So the next thing that happens is you get arrested again. Arrested again. And what are you arrested for again now this time? I'm arrested for cyber stalking. Well, and more than that, I, I mean, so, okay. So just so I can explain this to, to people who are listening, your motion for rehearing and reconsideration is granted. All that meant was that we were gonna do another hearing on the merits of your injunction so that we can explain to the judge why that injunction should be dropped. So that hearing is, ends up being set for like July. 
So we're still waiting. We're still, you still have this injunction against you that shouldn't have been filed in the first place. In May, we get this motion for rehearing and reconsideration. So we're finally getting somewhere. We're starting to gain steam. We're starting to gain some steam. And I should mention, who was it that was paying for all of your wife's attorney's fees? Phyllis and John, which were my parents. And why were they doing that? Um, they were doing that so they can have uh, full control over the children. So, but what was, let's just go back a little bit and talk about the dynamic with your mother. And because I, I think this is really important at this juncture, because we also, I, there's something else that happened in March that I want to make sure that we mention. Let's go back and talk about the dynamic between your parents and, and your you and your brother and sister. Your parents have t traditionally supported everybody, right? Everybody. And you had become successful and decided you didn't need their help anymore. No. I, I, wanted to, I, I wanted to branch out. I guess I didn't want to be controlled anymore. I wanted to be my own person, my own identity. And talk about your mother for a little bit. What's her um, personality type? Dr. Hansen called it right where it, right what it is. She thinks she's the godfather of the family, uh, controlling. Um, she has to be involved with everyone else's business. If you cross her, it's, uh, it's the ultimate sin. Um, she wanted to be the, that face of the family. So the fact that you didn't want her involved in your marriage or your children, she, how did she take that? I didn't want her involved with my, my family anymore. Uh, it was that control issue. Uh, uh, you know, she, wanted, she was telling my children what to do, what to wear, uh, what school to go to, what time to be in bed. And hadn't she at one point, like maybe a year, two years before the divorce started, filed or, 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 or threatened to file or maybe did file some papers to try to get custody? She tried of to file a temporary custody order uh, behind uh, my ex-wife and m myself uh, without us knowing. Right. So she's trying to get the kids away from you trying to get the kids away from both of us. Right. And um, why was she doing that? I guess the only thing I can probably think of today is um, she was doing that to save her marriage. And what was going on in her marriage? Her husband was having an affair with a nurse at the hospital, I believe. Now, what did she do to that nurse, by the way? What didn't she do? <laughs> um, she stalked her. She... Uh, slashed her tires. She um, had her sister involved at one point, uh, threatening phone calls. Um, I believe there was an, an injunction filed against her from uh, this nurse. She was harassing her, showing up at uh, the hospital unannounced, showing up at uh, this woman's house. So, yeah. And so going back to what was she doing with your kids, even while your marriage was still intact, didn't your parents give your older son like a burner phone or something like that? Yes, Phyllis and John gave a drawaway phone, which I'm sure we, we call it the burner phone, and told him, don't tell your parents that we gave you this phone so you can contact us because we told our, we told our kids at the time that um, we wanted to get some kind of our independent family stable and stability before... Uh, allowing them to see the grandparents again. So you were trying to put up boundaries. Correct. And have healthy boundaries. And, and Phyllis wasn't having that. They weren't having it whatsoever. Yeah. They, at one point, I believe they gave Justin a tape recorder as well to uh, record our conversations. So... Your wife at, at some point just decided if you can't beat them, join them. 
That's probably the correct terminology. Yeah. He jumped ship. Right. So in March, before we had the hearing, your mother leaves you a voicemail. I believe, I, I believe the voicemail was on my way to the hearing. And what did that say? You know, I still have that voicemail. <laughs> I need a copy of that voicemail, unless I, I might have it, but I, you need to send that to me. Um, <laughs> um, basically, that voicemail was a threatening voicemail saying that uh, she's going to do whatever it takes to uh, basically defend her grandchildren. Can I play it? Yeah, please do. Cool. This is mom. Listen, I don't care what you think of me, but what you are doing to these kids mm -hmm. is terrible. Doreen mm -hmm. has no problem with you seeing the kids, <clears throat> taking them to dinner, doing things with them, taking them on a little vacation to so-called Disney, but these kids do not want to sleep over. Mason is afraid. He's afraid of everything. You are ruining their lives. So I'm going to make you this one offer and one offer only. If you continue to destroy these kids, how far they have come, I am calling the district attorney's office this afternoon. I am giving them the papers about Tetra, and I am going to report it to the district attorney and Homeland Security. You have a federal, you have a case coming up soon, and that's all the district attorney needs to get a hold of. So unless you're smart enough and stop thinking about getting back at Doreen through the kids, I suggest you listen and listen very carefully because I am not going to take this anymore. I already called the district attorney's office and I have a phone call into him. Don't let me have to do this, Paul, because I will do it. So think twice about what you're doing. Love, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Is that chilling or what? I mean, I, I get the I, I get the chills listening to that. Oh my god! It's like I can't even believe that she had the nerve to put that on a, a, a tape. And but and that that recording that message came as as I was being driven to the courthouse to face, I guess, the first charge. Well, the, to finally have a hearing. Yeah. And it was like in March, it was, so it's like three or four months later to finally finish the hearing on the merits of whether or not you should have this injunction. And, and um, I, uh, I believe that message was sent because she knew we were gaining momentum. Right. And, and uh, um, she was going to do whatever it takes to um, bring up these false allegations. Well, include helping your wife doctor photos to present in court. Correct. Okay, so that was in March. So in May, um, we finally get the motion for rehearing uh, granted based on the fact that it was obvious that the, the pictures were fake. Fake. At some point in this, during this period of time, we start to suspect, oh, I know what it was. I actually saw Doreen at a restaurant with Chris Knott's uh, private investigator partner. Mike Pearl. Mike Pearl. I saw her with him at a restaurant. Yes. And I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. Why is she out with the, these private investigators like socializing? Yes. So we hire a private investigator to see what's going on with her and, and these, because initially we thought maybe she was having uh, a romantic relationship with Mike Pearl. Correct. So we hire Al Perez, who's a private investigator. Yep. And what and does I, he find? I believe you had to reach out to him um, from another district because of the conflict. Yes, because they had already hired the ones that I normally used in Collier County. Yes. So we hire Al Perez, who's up in Lee County, and what does he find? Um, the explosive bombshell is she's having um, 
an affair with Chris Nutt. The private investigator who had filed the affidavit. Filed two false affidavits against me and having me arrested twice. Okay, well, we haven't even, let's finish oh, the second oh. arrest. Yes, yeah, so the second arrest in May is for doing what? Uh, cyber stalking. Well, not just cyber stalking. It was also going in his neighborhood. Oh, so, 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 yeah, cyber stalking and then uh, going into his neighborhood, uh, supposedly me following his, uh, being around his home or his family members. And what was his basis for saying that? Because wasn't he seeing, like you have, so you own a restaurant that has like- A uh, delivery service. A delivery service. And he, and and one of the cars or a couple of the cars have like, they're Deli wrapped so that they have the name of the restaurant and everything on them, right? Correct. So he saw the car- The car going by his home. That had your, your restaurant name on it. Correct. Because you, you know, people were doing deliveries. Right. Do you ever do your own deliveries? Yes. Well, not not all the. I mean, today sometimes yes, but back back then no. I'm fully managing the restaurant. Yeah. So you weren't in his neighborhood. I was not in his neighborhood. But he. So let's talk about Chris Knott for a second. Chris Knott was a private investigator. What else was he? Former. He, he was a former Kyler County Sheriff's Office. And what happened to him there? He was fired from the Kyler. Well, we found out, or you found out, that he was fired from the Kyler County Sheriff's Office for uh, sexual harassment and his misconduct towards uh, some uh, some females at a restaurant in the parking lot. Yeah, so he's fired for inappropriate behavior for misconduct from the Collier County Sheriff's Office. Yes. But we also found out that he still had ties and friends. In the police force. Uh, yes, and also in the state attorney's office. Correct. That there were certain state attorneys high up that he uh, was getting to do things for him. Yes. So you get arrested again in May or June of 2016 for allegedly stalking Chris Knott. Correct. Cyber stalking. And now it's a second violation. Second violation. I call it the, uh, the spear that destroyed me for quite some time. And that one you were, you were arrested where? Uh, in the restaurant in front of all my customers. And as you're being led to the police car, you look up and what do you see? Chris not in his vehicle, uh, honking the horn, basically saying, I got you. Waving, smiling, laughing. I'm laughing. And because you're violating it a second time, how long did you have to spend in jail that time? 13 days. And Donald Day is representing you for that as well. Yes. But this all, oh, I remember actually, this happened like on Friday before Memorial Day weekend. Correct. So we couldn't even do anything until the following week. Correct. Yeah. So then Donald Day, gets the charges dropped or something, right? I had, to, I had to take a plea deal for the first injunction or the first violation so he can get me out on the second violation. And what was the plea deal? Uh, I, had to plead, I had to plead guilty on the violation of the injunction on the first... Uh, one that we didn't even get into court to defend ourselves. And, and the first one, of course, was the bogus- The bogus- uh, <laughs> Affidavit by the, her boyfriend. Correct. Who was married at the time, by the way. Married with three children. Yeah. 
So that happens. And the next thing that happens while we're still waiting to get the heat rehearing is now you get another injunction slapped on you for the kids for what? Because, oh, I know what happened. So in March, she hires another lawyer. Correct. And this guy and I are actually able to get, uh, we got 50-50 time sharing done. Yes. So you start doing your 50-50 time sharing at that point. So, Correct. So um, we, we tried to settle the rest of the case. We don't get the rest of the case settled, but we do get 50-50 done. Correct. So for, for, from March through June, you're seeing the kids half the time. Correct. So then what happens after you do the plea deal and then we're still oh, prior, the hearing? Uh, prior to me, prior to you getting that 50-50 parenting plan, I didn't see my children for almost... 18 months. No, 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 no. That was the next time. This is just three months. You didn't see them from December to March. Right. So I didn't see them for three months. Three okay. months. Go ahead. Yeah. Cause I still have that picture of you taking them to the baseball game. Uh, the first time you had seen them and it had been three months. Correct. Yeah. Um, do you remember that picture? Is, was that the one when uh, they're both sitting, we're sitting uh, yes. and the Boston Red Sox, I yeah, think? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. So, okay, so now you hadn't seen them in three months, but now you've at least, you've been seeing them regularly from March to June. And in June, what happens? It was Father's Day, I believe. Yes. And I took the children to uh, um, up in... Cape Coral. It was like some kind of a water park. Uh, zip lining. Zip lining. Oh, zip lining. That's what it was. Yes. I took them zip lining in um, somewhere in, up in northern Florida somewhere. I don't know the exact location. And um, it was Father's Day weekend and all having a great time. And... We come back so that we came back on, uh, we came back that Sunday night. And then I believe Monday was the transfer day where uh, the mom gets the chill, uh, gets her time sharing. That's when the nightmare began. Uh, I was. Uh, <laughs> Continued. <laughs> uh, the, um, I believe there was a injunction filed of a child abuse claim. Yeah. And let's just talk about that for a second, because you had been very much against any kind of corporal punishment up until this claim, right? Correct. Uh, and everybody knew it. Everybody knew it. Phyllis and John, uh, I, I think, uh, I believe the pediatrician knew that I was against corporal punishment. And you, your wife even told the custody evaluator that you were always against it. Correct. Because when you were growing up, tell about this thing that was hanging in your house, this wooden uh, spoon. No wooden spoon. So there was this wooden spoon hanging in your house. Then what did your parents do with it? They used to beat us with it. They used to hit us with it. And your brother and sister also have wooden spoons hanging in their homes, right? Correct. And, and what was your position on that? There was no wooden spoons in my house. Because why? Um, I didn't like it and I was against corporal punishment. And so you had never laid a hand on your kids? Never ever touched my children. So in the middle of all this craziness, while we're still waiting for your hearing on our motion for rehearing on the bogus whole other thing, all of a sudden you've become a child beater. I become the child beater. And so they attached pictures that said you had done what to your younger child? That I beat, I, that I beat Mason with, I think, a, was it a belt? Yes. Yes. And they had like pictures on his leg or something. Legs, back, arms, which uh, as you, I think if you remember the pictures, there was no, they were black and white, couldn't see nothing. Um, you couldn't even tell if it was his leg. Yes. It could have been anybody's leg. 
And it was like something on his back too, something on his back. Yeah. Right. So now we're, we're dealing with that now too. And um, so uh, we go to the hearing on that and lo and behold, another new lawyer. Another new lawyer. Was that number five? Yeah, I think so. So now she's hired Herman Tarno, right? Correct. Or I should say Phyllis hired Herman Tarno. Phyllis hired Herman Tarno. Right, and the reason why Phyllis hired him was because why? She didn't like what she was hearing from Koenig. She didn't like the fact that Koenig had gotten you a 50-50 deal. Yeah. And plus, wasn't uh, Herman Tarnow one of your dad's patients or something? Correct. They were doing a barter system. Yeah. So and going back, back to Koenig as well, Koenig was involved. Koenig, ironically, shared, shared an office, or Chris Knott served an office with Koenig. That's right. That's right. I remember that now. So, but meanwhile, Phyllis is like leaving all these lawyers with unpaid bills. Um, so, but she did, I, I think she had done some sort of trade with, with uh, Chris Knott as well, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, uh, oh, by the way, we didn't mention what Al Perez found, the bombshell video with Chris Knott. That's when it all made sense is uh, where uh, Doreen was having an affair with uh, Mr. Knott. So we get the private investigator to follow them mm -hmm. and they come out of a bar and what happens? I think they started making out on the motorcycle. Yeah, right yeah. on video. Right on video. Yep, and she had like grabbed his face and like, yeah. you know, the whole thing was like very obvious. It was- Very obvious. I remember the day that that video came in, everyone in my law firm, we all watched it together, like with like popcorn basically, like, oh my God, you know? I believe that, I believe that was probably the turning point of the case. I think, I think that's, well, I, I that's think, when think, we all started to realize what the hell was going on. I guess, yeah, I think that's when you figured out why these injunctions kept uh, coming into play. And I actually contacted uh, the private investigators bureau, whoever governs them. Uh, it was like um, it, it, Department of Licensing and Agriculture or something. And I had spoken to some guy who was like, had been investigating Chris Knott and wrongdoing for a long time. Yes. And he wanted to go after him. I think we decided to kind of wait because we didn't want backlash or something. We wanted this divorce to be done first or something. Yes. Um, but, you know, I mean, so this was like at a very high level. I mean, we had crooked state attorneys, crooked cops who are willing to arrest you on nothing. Um, you know, at this point, it's just like, you're just feeling like, how? Like, how are you feeling at this point? Words can't even describe it. It was just such a train wreck. I felt like, um, like the way uh, that I felt like I was fighting an army, uh, that I couldn't even find a chance to breathe, a chance to, uh, I didn't even know what was going on. Um, I was being attacked on all different levels. Every time I turned around, it was something. Uh, I guess the frustration was just growing and growing. I mean, uh, I remember times when you were lecturing me, uh, we'll have our day in court, we'll get there. Um, horrible. I never, ever want to live that moment again. It was probably one of the uh, darkest days of my life. I mean, I remember going to see you in jail the second time. Yep. And you were just, you know, like broken, basically. Unbelievable. I, broken. 
Yeah. I mean, I just remember you like sobbing saying, this is not me. I, how did I get here? Like here you are, you know, successful re restaurateur. You've got your life is under control. You've got um, two kids, a nice home, you know, you're making it for yourself and this is what's happening. And your own mother, who's a malignant narcissist. Orchestrating this whole thing. Orchestrating this whole thing. And what did I tell you at that point? <sighs> um, hang in there. Uh, let me get us into the courtroom. Let me get us, uh, we'll get there. You told me, uh, I remember those words, you telling me that um, uh, we'll have our day in court. Uh, let me guide you there, let me get you there, and uh, uh, we'll get to tell our side of the story. And hang in there. Yeah, yeah, don't give up. Don't give up, you believed in me 100%. Yeah, and I remember saying, you have to believe you can win. Yep. If you and I think, I think you told me at one point we are going to win. Yeah. And, but I said, you had to believe it too. Yep. So we're in June. Now you have this second injunction uh, or and now it's an injunction on the kids. And we have the motion for rehearing set for like August or something. And that's where Herman Tarnow shows up. Yes. I think we actually have that motion for rehearing at that point. But I think what happens is Judge Evans at that point decides she's just going to set it for trial. Yes. And do, and do everything at once. Correct. Okay. So it, trial is supposed to be set for like December or something. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened there? It just continued to get continued. It just continued after continued. And I believe Donald Day was still... Uh, in the picture at the time. Right. Right. So he does that motion for rehearing and we present all of our evidence and it looks like we're going to win that. We had a hearing that summer. I remember going there and seeing Herman. And at the time he was like trying to get you to sign something. Because during this whole period, we were also trying to get, I think I was trying to get her to sign off on refinancing this balloon payment or something because at the time you're also trying to deal with stuff that's going on with the business and the building and um and, and that sort of thing and we're also trying to sell the house at this point correct and and while she's trying to sell the house or while we're trying to sell the house she is um sabotaging every uh every sale that's coming through that home. Right. So, I mean, like dog poop on the, uh, you know, living room floor that the realtor is having to pick up. So the hearing gets reset for November. So everything just continues to get pushed back. And meanwhile, you're supposed to have like supervised time sharing with your kids. We agree somewhere in September, October to uh, Dr. Hansen being yes. um, the evaluator. custody evaluator. So now everything gets pushed back because we're waiting for the custody evaluation. So the custody evaluation comes out in like March, I want to say, of 2017, somewhere in there. And what does that say? I, I believe it said everything that w we've been saying all along. I remember something that stands out and I still remember it to this day. It said something that uh, Miss Landy and the paternal grandmother has, has risen above the domestic violence in this courtroom. Alienation has occurred. Mm -hmm. and it, the, uh, they dwarfed and, uh, the relationship between the father and son. Basically, didn't it say your mother was like the godfather of the family? Of the family yes. <clears throat> and that she was the one that had caused the problems? Yes. It was adding fuel to the fire. So what does she recommend with regard to your children and your parents? 
no contact. Right. She recommends no contact. There is considerable concern about the grandparents' involvement, most notably the grandmother's involvement. She is toxic in her disdain for her son and is likely a strong player in the over-litigation that has occurred in this case. She is funding Ms. Landy's legal battle and is adamant to keep the grandchildren from Mr. Landy from all accounts of the collaterals. She is likened to the quote unquote godfather with her need for control over her family members and Mr. Landy committed the unforgivable sin by excommunicating with her. She also attempts to buy the children by promising them material goods if they are good for their mom, do not give their mother a hard time. Uh, Both children are very aware of her disdain for their father and have cited several examples of her speaking poorly of him. Uh, She's paying for the mother's legal fees. So his behavior is nothing compared to the wife's. Needless to say, there needs to be strict boundaries on the Landy grandparents' involvement with Justin and Mason. So we end up going to trial in April of 2017. And it's a six day trial. And what happens at trial? What I took out of that trial was, uh, it was amazing how um, I was on the stand for hours upon hours. And I don't know, I I think you would recall this. Doreen was only on the stand for maybe 15 minutes or 30 minutes out of the whole trial. And uh, um, I think that's something the judge pointed out too during the trial was um, that she didn't speak too much. She didn't say too much. I thought you were brilliant on how you handled it. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Um, The one thing that stands out the most was, uh, which I think hit the judge hard was you showing me uh, Mason's Father's Day card to me, I think. And I think that's when I broke. Do you remember that day? You remember that day? Of course. I felt that um, uh, you and John were brilliant. There's so many things that happened that day. It was just so stressful, so emotional. I think I remember telling you guys on the way down to the, uh, to the trial that I think you remember, I says, I, I looked at you both, said, whatever happens, I thank you guys. And I knew we were going to win. I just knew it. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the things that I remember is that during the trial, the wife had lied about something on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or something, something with DCF. Because DCF yeah. had been um, like visiting you or something. R- remind me what that was. Because I remember thinking, like pointing out to the judge, which was it, you know, like, so remind me about that. Um, that's when DCF uh, showed up at uh, the wife's home and uh, she, she did not let DCF interview the children. But there was something about her saying that something had happened on a Tuesday night or something, but she was supposed to have the kids that night. Like if you looked at the schedule and then she said that she couldn't take them or something like, and, and I remember saying like, well, if you, couldn't take them like if you were so worried about like because it was like the tuesday after there was something inconsistent with her the timeline right so sunday is when she says this all happened with mason correct tuesday she sends them back to you no sunday it happened no she sent them back she sent them back to me on wednesday because that's the so Sunday it happened, Monday and Tuesday, there was no issues. And then Wednesday, she sent the kids back to me. Right. And, but then, like, I, I was like saying something like, I remember her saying like she couldn't take the kids or something. And I was like, well, which is it? Like, why are you sending them back to him if they had just been beaten that like, and it was actually only one of the kids. It wasn't even both. 
Right. Was, it was just the youngest child. Right. But somehow you weren't allowed to see the older one either. Correct. But she had lied about something that had happened and the timeline was totally off. Yes. Um, and so we caught her in that lie as well. Correct. So anyway, we have the six day trial and she only testifies for like 15 minutes. We have, we call your parents, both your parents, your brother, who is fully on the Phyllis and John payroll, right? Yep, the gravy train. Yep. So he's not going against his, the spoon that feeds his mouth. Yes. And then we call Chris Knott. Talk about that testimony. Supposedly all these allegations against me, all these recordings, all these tapes, and uh, uh, he couldn't prove anything. I, I believe he told the courts that uh, he destroyed all the evidence. Correct. He destroyed all the evidence. Yes. And why did he say he destroyed it all? I believe there was nothing to show, saying that there was nothing I did. Yes concrete evidence of me doing anything. Yeah. So um, he, and then at the end, the last question that we asked of him was what? The last question was, are you having a sexual late relationship with uh, Doreen Landy? Yeah. And his answer was? Yes. And that was the, the last of his. No further questions, Your Honor. Yeah. I mean, how crazy is that? And I mean, he admitted to writing this affidavit while he was having a sexual relationship with her. So therefore, you had gone through all this, right, for, for nothing, basically, just because your mother had orchestrated. Oh, and who was paying for Chris Knott, the private investigator's uh, bill? Phyllis and John. What was the outcome of the trial? We won. Uh, the judge saw Drew all the uh, all the BS. It was a bittersweet moment, I would say. It took her a while to rule, but when she did, uh, we were victorious. Like I told you, you guys were brilliant, brilliant. So you ended up getting what? Ultimate decision making, fifty percent time sharing. Fifty percent, but lots of supervised stuff on her because yes. she wasn't allowed to do what? I got a lot of time back uh, with me and the boys. She wasn't allowed to see the children for an extended period of time. And uh, your parents weren't allowed to see them? Uh, no contact order until uh, me and my ex-wife come up to an agreement. And it's still in, it's still in place as of today. Yeah, and, and there were therapists appointed for the children. Yes. And um, Dr. Hansen had to be, you know, come back in and testify again like a year later, right? Correct. And what, what was she testifying on? My ex-wife violating the uh, grandparents' uh, order of not seeing the children. In the end, you also ended up with what with regard to your restaurants and the building and everything? Everything was awarded to me. You got everything. Everything. And so I, are they still trying to get at you now? Yes. <laughs> what are they doing now? The, wit the witch hunt will always continue on their end. They're trying to get me for child support right now. Yeah, it was a modified the child support. Mod modified child support. But that's all they have anymore. That's all they have anymore and uh, um, our last hearing, um, nothing happened. We're still waiting on uh, another hearing, as what we call it is, they, all they have is smoke and mirrors. Did you have to pay any of her attorney's fees or anything like that? No. No, so uh, did you have to pay her alimony? Um, I think that uh, it was called the bridge to gap alimony. And all she got was, we. I think we shared an account that had like, Seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars in it, and uh, the judge just told me to do the right thing, so I just gave her whatever was there. So uh, um, out of this whole thing, she got eighteen thousand dollars or seventeen thousand. And that's it. That was it. 
So in the end, karma won out. Karma won out. Um, I, I strongly believe there's there's no winners or losers. I mean, uh, you know, there's it's going to be scarred for life, uh, no matter which way you look at it. My boys are going to be scarred for life. Um, but at the end of the day, you you gave me my life. I mean, I didn't have to start over. Um, um, I'm still successful. I'm still going stronger than ever. You're like my role model. I mean, you gave me that confidence to move on. Um, I think about you guys all the time. Like I'm indebted to you guys. I mean, every time I go somewhere, every time I'm in with uh, um, the attorney who you appointed me now, um, I'm always talking about you guys. Uh, you guys done wonders for me. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. It's like the U.S. currency, like in God we trust. I would say in Rebecca we trust. You guided me as a mother figure, as a friend, as a lawyer. I don't think I could have done it without you. Um, you became that the rock that I needed at that timing. You became that focal point for me. Um, more or less, I mean, I strongly believe, I mean, I look at you as that mother figure. You know, you took me by the hand. You guided me. I listened to you. I know times were bad at times. I wanted to give up, um, but you kept you kept me strong. You kept me straight and narrow. I'm indebted for you for life. I mean, uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about what you've done. You gave me that motivation. You gave me that spark. With all the people out there listening, you've got to get Rebecca's program. It will save your life. At the end of the day, she is going to help you, and she helped me great dealy. Without Rebecca, I wouldn't have my kids back. I wouldn't have my life back. And I wouldn't be where I am today.